Hi, I'm Mike Bessler. I've been invited down here today to, to Tori Hughes' Art Ranch studio to uh, bring you another video production in the series called Mastering the New Clay. Today we're going to be working with uh, metallic clays, which are a special group of clays that have a metallic material built right into them. We're not going to be using powders, um, leaf, or any of those other materials that you may have used in the seen in the past. Uh, here's some examples of uh, some pieces that we're going we're to cover today. Here's a necklace that I made. We're going to be looking at beads like this, making beads like this. Here's what's cool about these. What about this clay? It actually is this shiny, the, the motion, the light. It's all about light with these. So there's that one. Then we'll do something that looks like these. You've probably seen things like this before, but look at the luster on these little snail-like beads. Here's a necklace that I made <clears throat> using a, that same technique. Belongs to my wife. We like it a lot. Uh, then we'll do another type of a bead. Looks like this. Uh, we'll show you how to do that bead. Here's, here it is uh, in a slightly different color combination, but strung up. Uh, there you go. And then here's another variation of the same thing also, made into a pendant. Okay, get a good look at that. Here's a couple of a pair of earrings that I made. Again, um, very similar, but you'll see some interesting things going on there. And then we'll wind up uh, the lesson today with showing you how to make a locket, something like this one, hopefully, because it could be either a pendant or a locket. And the locket quality is right here inside this little door. There's a place for you to put a picture or whatever. I stuck a little uh, snowflake in this one, but you could put anything you wanted to in there. There's one of them. Here's one that I made for my wife for Valentine's Day this year. Made her real happy. And that one has a different type of a door. It swings out of the way like this. And there's the heart that I cut out of that lid. Here's one more. And we're going to make one very much like this today. This one has the same type of a door. When you swing it out of the way, there's a little uh, spiral with a freshwater pearl glued into it. So these are just uh, a few examples of the kinds of things that you can do with this metallic clay. It's great stuff. It's just uh, a heck of a lot of fun. I, it's, it's magic as far as I'm concerned. So let's get busy. Well, let's run through the tools we're going to need to do today's lesson. We are going to need a toaster oven, one that you want to dedicate to the use of polymer clay. Uh, it's kind of a good idea to get a thermometer and check the temperature so that you can bake according to the manufacturer's specifications. We're going to need a pasta machine. This one I've modified just slightly. I've added some surgical tape or a piece of paper, if you like, on the back side of the pasta machine. That's to keep the clay from sticking there. You'll find that this metallic clay has a real tendency to do that. It's a pretty handy item. We need a container for sanding, a flat bottom container. Uh, metal or glass is fine. Need some sandpaper, some wet or dry sandpaper. I've got grits of 240, 400, and 600. Works pretty well for me. And then a non nice non-porous work surface. In this case, I've got a great sheet of glass here. And I've also added underneath the glass uh, a little piece of graph paper. That's kind of handy when you're make, having to make some uh, precise cuts. It's an optional item, but uh, it's helpful. I think you might like that. Then we've got a, a variety of small tools, hand tools and things. Let's take a look at some of those. You need your standard tissue blade, nice flat, sharp object, some sort of a scraping tool. Uh, a, a pa here's a palette knife. I don't know exactly what this one is called, but it's a, it'll do the same thing. We need a roller of some kind. This is a brayer or the lucite rod. A lot of people like that. That's just fine. You can get that around. Make sure you get that. Uh, some sort of hole cutters. These are the Kemper cutters and a little canopy cutter right there. A couple pairs of pliers. Uh, I think those are chain nose pliers and a, a set of diagonal pliers. These are burnishing tools. A little straight handled thing with a bead on the end is called a burnishing tool. You can get those at most art and hobby stores. Uh, the one next to it is another burnishing tool. I've wrapped some wire around the handle of that, and I use it as a specialized tool for texturing the clay, and I'll show you how to use that later. Then we've got a needle tool, some sort of a pointed um, long hat pin, or in this case, it looks like an awl. Then I've got a, this thing's called a pin vise with a, about a sixteenth of an inch size drill bit in there. I've got an X-Acto knife. 
I'm going to need a straight edge for a number of different things. So I've got, I use some card stock that I cut down here. A ruler would be okay for that. And this little piece of stuff right there is actually scotch bright. It's a non-metallic uh, uh, scouring pad. Ordinary, you can find it in the grocery store in the kitchen section. And that's all you need. And that pretty much covers it. Let's walk through the materials that we're going to need for our projects today. We're certainly going to need some clay. For this lesson, we're going to specify a specific brand. We're going to, we're going to need to use Primo Sculpey metallic clay. It's not a paid product endorsement or anything like that. It just happens to be the only clay that has the properties that we need to complete today's projects. It comes in two sizes. It comes in one pound bricks, and it also comes in these smaller two ounce uh, bricks. Make sure that you have at least four ounces of each of the colors that we need. And those colors will be gold, silver, plain pearl, green pearl, blue pearl, red pearl. And we use one non-metallic clay just as a little mixer. It's violet. So you have your clay. You want an assortment of beads. These are little embellishment items. Uh, so I'm not going to specify too much what you pick. This depends on your color choice and the, the, the uh, particular thing that you make. So I have an assortment of those. These are in the range of three to five millimeters or so. We'll need some type of super glue, cyanacrylate type of glue. This is Zappa Gap, our family favorite around here. Um, some kind of cords, chains that we'll use for the lockets later on. And that little hinge that you saw on the locket is made actually from a, a standard little pin back. So have some of those. We'll modify them. I'll show you how to do that. Some eye pins, some 22 or 20 gauge, um, what do they call this stuff? Craft wire, jewelry wire. That, that'll work just fine. Then we need uh, a cloth that I use both for cleaning up my workspace and also for buffing to getting a nice high gloss on some of these pieces. If you have a buffing wheel, you can use that, but this cloth will work just fine. And that should uh, get us through today's lesson. Let's see if I can show you what it is that, that's so unique about this metallic clay. Now, this took me a couple of years to figure all this stuff out. Right out of the package, you pick up a piece of gold or whatever it is, and you expect it to do things like other polymer clay, and it won't. It doesn't. You'd, instead of getting a nice solid piece of gold, you get something that's kind of brown, caramely looking stuff. And then you think, well, you'll just condition it like you condition your other clay. This is what I thought. So you roll it and you twist it, <coughs> thinking it's going to make it all nice and smooth. But no, you get something that's all full of swirls and dark spots. Now I'll take this to the pasta machine one time that I think it'll show that a little bit better here. That this is not a very uniform looking piece of clay. Bring it back in here. And you can see how marble it is. It's not solid, shiny clay. Took me a while to figure out what that was all about. Uh, the reason this stuff behaves this way is because when it's manufactured, they add to it what makes it shiny in the first place is that they add mica flakes to it. Now, I've got a little mica flake over here I'll bring in. This is actually natural mica. It's a naturally occurring mineral. It has a pretty shiny surface on each side. It's like a two-sided mirror, very thin thing. When you grind this stuff up, they actually use a man-made substitute for this, but it's, it's a lot like this. When you grind this up and mix it into the clay, those pieces are all jumbled around in the clay. Some of them are, sh are, are flat side towards you. Some of them are edged towards you, giving you these darks and lights in here. And although it's kind of attractive, uh, it, 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 you need to understand how it works in order to, to really put it to your, our advantage. Um, so let me show you what happens to it when we pass it through a pasta machine. When it goes to the pasta machine, the pressure of the rollers forces all those mica flakes in nice little neat little flat rows, flat side up. And all the kind of graininess goes away after, I don't know, five, ten times or so. Just keep doing it until it looks nice and smooth. And then I'll bring it back and show it to you. There's a nice smooth sheet of gold, which is what we were after in the first place, with none of that graininess in there. All those mica flakes have been aligned in this flat direction like this. 
Now, I'm going to show you another little thing here to really bring that point home. Just fold it in half so I've got a little bit thicker piece to work with right down here. And take a little slice off like this <coughs> and then show you that edge. There's the edge that I just cut off. Look how it compares to the shiny surface that we worked so hard to get. This edge is sort of analogous to the edge of the mica flakes. All those mica flakes have been lined up flat. These are flat this way, shining at us. And then when I took that slice off and rotated it, here we're looking at edges, and they don't reflect very much. It makes this stuff sort of a two-colored, kind of a two-faced stuff. Uh, it behaves very much like uh, a, a clay that has two sides to it, two, uh, two different colors in, in it. And uh, th that's the principle behind almost everything that we're going to do today. It's, uh, th it's this property that I love so well that uh, kind of is the, it's the really the magic. It's the secret behind all these projects we're going to do today. Well, here's a fun and easy little bead to make with just what we know so far. Um, what I did is mixed up another color here. I took uh, some equal part of gold and pearl green. When you mix colors, stick with the pearls and metallics. That is, don't bring non-metallic colors into it. Anyway, I mixed those together, blended them in the pasta machine, rolled them out, making sure we line up all those mica flakes, and uh, took a couple of sheets, stacked them up like so, cut a, a strip off that has a square cross-section. That is, it's a, is just as wide as it is thick. And you can see on the end right there, I think. You can see how that's a square cross-section. Then I'm just simply going to take the ends of it, twist them like this one, bake it, and cut it up into some beads like this. Let's run through one of those, and then you'll, you'll see how easy they are and how fun they are. So I've already stacked up my two sheets like this. I need a nice straight edge to work with. So take your, your straight edge. I'm going to use my, uh, my card stock. You might use a ruler or whatever. And uh, with a tissue blade, trim that edge up. This is just a squared off to, to begin with. This is going to be a throwaway piece coming off of here. It actually serves as sort of a guide once I cut that strip off. Lay it down here. I lay it in the sheet. You can see it right there. That's how wide I want my strip to be. The same width as that piece right there. So approximate that. Move this out of the way and cut one out. Then it's just a matter of, whoops, it's coming apart on me. Picking that up and starting to, to holding each end. Let me move this out of the way so this looks a little bit better right here. Here we go. Take this thing and just start twisting it. Twist it kind of slow. Watch it go. It'll just slowly relax in your fingers as you go. And once you get it uh, to where you like it, press each end down onto something. Pull it a little bit. It kind of evens everything out. And now simply transfer it to a, uh, your baking tray and bake it. When, it. when you get done with that, you'll come out with one that looks just like this, which is now cooked, this piece, which is, has been baked, and take your there. Just the waste end, the part that we stuck down in the glass is going to be a throwaway piece, so cut that off. And then decide on a length. Now I made these about three quarters of an inch. Here's one of them I've already cut off. Let's use it as a guide. This is all up to you how, how long you want to make those. And line it up and cut right down through it like that. The last thing to do is take a, a pin vise, a drill. There it is. And drill a hole through them. Now, I do this after I bake them. You could push the hole through there before you cook them with a, a needle or something like that, but it requires handling the beads, and that's, that becomes a problem. So I like to do mine bake first, then drill. And there's an example of, of a finished bead. Now, let me show you how nice that looks when we put it together into a, a necklace. There, I've, I've strung some black spacer beads um, along with those, and look at how it's almost on fire there. Looks really pretty good. Here's another neat little trick that's very similar to that last one. I call it the beehive trick or the beehive bee, if you'd like. It's, it involves simply taking a, cutting a strip 
from one of those sh rolled out sheets that I showed you a minute ago and twisting it up just like we did that long bead and then wrapping it around an armature, meaning uh, a piece of scrap clay, is what I'm calling an armature, like that. Uh, and just coiling it around. Let me see, there we go. It showed it pretty well. Keep, just wrap it like this and tuck it as you go. When you run out of this strip, cut another one and kind of butt it up against the end of this one and just continue until you've filled the whole thing in. When you finish with that, the whole thing will look like this kind of cool thing here. Actually, you could stop and make yourself a little acorn, I guess, if you wanted to. That's kind of cool. Anyway, there's a lot of uses for that. Let me show you. Here's some, some, some uh, beehive beads. Maybe you can see why I called them beehive beads in the first place. These are some beads uh, that belong to my wife. Actually, she got married in these, my wonderful wife, Diane. Uh, so there's some. Uh, here's another actually totally different application for it, one of these lockets that we're going to look at a little bit later. That little trim right around there is an example of the beehive stuff. I just took a little strip of uh, some silvery clay and wrapped it around there as a border. And in fact, the whole door here was made that way. That little lid, which we opens up there, is made exactly the same way. And then even going further, getting away from uh, jewelry, there's something as outrageous as this, which belongs to one of my favorite people. This uh, is a Rhea egg that I covered with the same there. You see that beginning of that twist there and wraps all the way around. I just kept on going until I finished the whole thing. So there's just all kinds of things you can do with it. Here's another egg that I made that's a little bit different. Let me show you how it how it's different. This one's a little bit more multicolored. But what's, what I did with this one is when I finished it, uh, I actually rolled it in my hand, took some of the texture out of it, and smoothed it out and rolled it out, and uh, gave it a whole different feel and look. There are basically two uh, units that we are going to use for this whole uh, lesson today. One of them you've already seen, that's the uh, metallic sheet that's been rolled through the pasta machine many, many times to get it nice and gold and shiny. The other one, is something that we're going to create from that, and it's, we call it the ingot. Actually, Pier Volcus calls it the ingot. The word ingot was, is borrowed from metallurgy, and it just refers to a, a sort of a loaf-shaped shaped, uh, piece of metal. Um, the way we make these is by taking our sheets, our carefully rolled out sheets, cutting some slices, and stacking them up like this. like that until we get something that looks about like this. Now, we're going to be using this ingot repeatedly for the projects that follow. And I, well, I want you to see what the properties of it are. It has a two shiny sides, the top and the bottom, and all the other sides are dull. So this is our other building block for the rest of the projects for today. We're going to be making a number of these. This little bead that you're looking at right here looks all the world like it's made out of two different colors. In fact, they, they do a kind of a neat, uh, you know, change of the light. You can see the light changing on them as it goes around. Well, in fact, this was made out of a single color from an ingot like we just showed you in the last segment here. And here's how, that, how we put that together. We start out with our rolled out sheets, which we cut into short segments and made a, an ingot now, remember, an ingot with the dull sides and the shiny side. <coughs> cut some slices from that ingot like these. They show, yeah, they show well. Now, this is the key part, how we're going to assemble those. I'll show you how that goes in a minute. Anyway, stack them up in a certain order, and then cut them into, uh, into quarters in this case, and then finally sand them, polish them, drill a hole in it, and string them up. Now, let me show you how to actually make those things. <clears throat> Here's an ingot that I've made. I'll cut it off this side because it's easier for you to see there. The, the thickness of these slices is not critical, but take a look now. Our ingot here, shiny side up, dull sides all around. We, this, these have to come from an ingot in order to work. So I just make some slices. Even, the number isn't even critical. I think I'm going to go with about six, let's say. Just cut off six equal slices. Yeah, is that showing okay? Am I, there we go. I got five there, one more. 
Now, here's the, here's the kind of critical part of this. You take, as, when you take these slices, notice there's a shiny side there and a dull side. Lay one down, lay the first one down, and then pick up the second one. Make sure that the next slice goes on top of that one. Turn 90 degrees, rotate it so that the shiny side is pointing in a different direction. So the first one went that way, and the second one went this way. Now just continue to stack them up, alternating back and forth, each one going the opposite from the, the one before it. And I'll show you this when I get it stacked up. Just pile them up like that. Make sure I get them right. <coughs> kind of push them together. This is what we're going to look at, what we're looking at the, ed the edge there. Rotate around there, you see it again. Now, I, you need to kind of squeeze this together a little bit so it doesn't fall apart once we cut our beads out. <coughs> Just give them a little bit of a squeeze. Now, um, then set them down in front of you like that. What I like to do is clean the sides up a little bit. You can see there's a lot of irregularity there. See that it sticks out like that. Um, clean that up, make it into a, uh, give it a square cross section. I'm cutting with the back of my blade. I do that a lot. Put down, cut that off of there. See how neat that looks there, that scrap. Rotate it. Cut that one off. This one. I'm going for more or less a square little block. There's how it looks now. Just cleaned up from before. Now, this is kind of a, a neat thing when you do this. I'm just going to cut it into four pieces, just once like this, and then once like that. You want to try to get these as square as you can. It'll make the, the, the final sanding a little bit easier. Uh, so I just cut right down through it one time, like that. This stuff tends to hang up on your blade a little bit. Here's why the wax paper is nice. You can just rotate that rather than having to scrape it off of your, your glass surface. Then cut it again this way. And there are four identical beads, each one having that same. Well, I got some blade drag on there. That uh, blade drag, let's, let's talk about that for a second. As the blade passes down through the clay, sometimes it kind of hangs up on the clay and uh, actually realigns those mica flakes a little bit and ruins our face a little bit. But that uh, is going to sand off. So we're going to get it back clean again. So there's one side, there's the other side. And so there they are. Now what I would do is take my needle tool and push a hole through them or go ahead and bake them first and then drill them later on. Uh, I think that's a fairly uh, easy process, but here's one that I baked without a hole in it, and I just take my, uh, uh, <laughs> my drill with the uh, pin vise, what I was trying to think of, line it up there and just drill it through. I usually go halfway from one side, turn it around, start out. That makes sure that the hole is going to be, s the hole is centered, and feel your way through, bring it all the way through, and there's your finished bead. Oh, except for one thing. We've got to sand this thing. This one's already been sanded, so uh, let me move this stuff out of the way for a second and drag my little sanding apparatus in here. Remember, we had this flat-bottomed dish with some water in it. <coughs> We're going to go through a sequence of, pick up one of these rougher beads here, a sequence of sanding, starting with the coarsest grit, 240 in our case. I like to just lay them right flat on the, it's barely even visible in there, but um, lay the bead down on one side and just give it a few strokes, keeping it flat. That's why the flat bottom here, because we can get a nice, shiny surface here. Rotate it over on one side, sand it again a few strokes until you go all the way around. Stop and inspect it once in a while if you want to. And then when we get done, hopefully it's, uh, it'll look like pretty clean sides. Depending on the grade of sandpaper that you chose, it might be done right there. Um, you can buff it if you like, but basically that's the finished bead. Very simple little bead uh, that uh, is pretty amazing coming from a single color. Oh, one of the advantages of this that I should mention, bringing these scraps back in here, these scrap pieces, all this stuff that I cut up, if, if for any reason this didn't turn out the way you liked it, you didn't like the looks of them, remember this is only one color. Wad it all back up into a, uh, a you know, a just a gob of clay like this, and run it back through your pasta machine again a number of times, lining up all the uh, mica flakes until you get a nice shiny sheet and do it all over again. It's one of the really cool things about uh, working with a single color. You can come back and reuse them again. 
As long as we're working in one color here, let me show you another variation that I, we can do with this. Look at the way this one plays with the light. It's just, it's just electric. I really like this a lot. And it's just a very minor change from that last one that we, that we did. Let me show you how that goes. We need a rolled out sheet of clay. We're going to stack it up into an ingot, cut some slices from it. And the only thing that's different here is that we'll stack them in a slightly different order rather than that alternating pattern we used before. I'm going to stack them up in a little spiral pattern. Actually, I should talk about that in a second. Uh, stack them up, rotating each one, oh, I don't know, a, a quarter of a turn or so, and continue around as many times as you want. There's nothing critical about the number of sheets here. It's kind of like a stack of napkins, if you can think of that. And then we're going to cut this stack into a square that looks like this. And then look what we get when we get done. We get this shimmering play of light on that piece. Now, then we're going to cut that into four pieces. Actually, my other one's over here. But we'll cut that into uh, quarters and sand, polish, drill a hole in it, and we've got it. I think the only thing you really need to see here is see me cut that stack down. What the heck is that all about? Now, let's take another look at that. See how those are stacked up in a spiral, kind of cascading arrangement like that. That's how it looks. So just cut your sheets from the ingot, stack them up. <coughs> I have to look down, straight down on the stack. It doesn't really matter where you start. We just want a, a square cross section when we get finished. So looking straight down on it, cut down through all those sheets, push that off of there, rotate it a little bit, rotate it, say, 90 degrees or so. Make your next cut. Another 90 degrees. Cut. Some of these sc scraps are really great here. Just look at this for a second. We all have fun looking at those. Must be something cool to do with those, too. And one more time. Then if I look at this and I see that there are any, like there's a, a bad corner there, trim a little more off. Get down on it and make one more cut. Get it as square as you can. That looks pretty good right there. There it is. You can see that shimmering light stuff. Next thing to do, looking down from the top, cut it into four approximately equal squares, rectangles, I guess, actually. And there they are. The neat thing is, what each one of these beads comes out looking just like that large one did in the first place with that shimmering, moving light form right there. The only thing left to do is to put a hole in it. Now, I'm going to I'm going to do this before we bake it. You could just as well bake them and drill it afterwards. but. Take your needle tool and work it. I usually go in halfway from each side, again, uh, to keep that centered up. But I suppose if you're good with one of these things, you could go all the way through. There we go, like that. There's that beautiful bead. These really came out so nice, you almost wouldn't even need to sand these. But they're not totally square. So the last step to do would be to uh, run it through the series of sandpaper and even maybe polish if you like it. And there it is. And that'd be easy. They make great earrings, by the way. These two beads that you see right here, these very different looking beads, are actually identical. Take a look at that one and then rotate it. It's exactly the same as this one. So there it is again. Kind of an, this little amazing little um, feature comes from the fact that uh, we've added another color here. The same way that uh, when we made a single colored bead with and rotated the shiny sides, it looks like a two colored bead. When we use two colors, we can make it look as though there are actually four colors. Now here's how I make those. This is the procedure is almost identical to the single colored bead, which is you need is two colors. This is a, the approximate recipe of how I came up with these colors. I've got roughly equal proportions of silver and pearl and about half that much uh, pearl red. Then I've mixed up some uh, half pearl, half silver, and I wind up with two ingots from those. Here's the silver one. Here's the red one. These are ingots, remember, shiny side up. We cut some slices from them. Probably can't see this over there. There we go. Cut some slices and stack them up. Remember, when you stack these up, to rotate the shiny sides. Here you see the silver side is shining is uh, pointing towards you. There's the shiny edge. Oh, maybe the other side will show it better. The, there you go. Here you see the shiny red, dull silver, 
shiny silver, dull red. Stack them up like that. Cut this stack into a square, nice and neat, like that. See how it changes like that? It really looks like four colors, very convincing effect. And then, of course, cut them into four into quarters. Each one of these has kind of a two-facedness to it, or it looks all the world like four colors. Bake them, sand them, drill your holes in them, and we wind up back there. They're just great little things. Um, I've got some examples of them in some other colors here. Here's one that I made in a uh, kind of a purple and blue combination. There, look at that. Look how that changes as you rotate it. And it's just two colors of clay. So we can put two of these side by side for a second and show you how. There they look the same. There, I got the string in the way, but I think you get the idea. These are kind of small. There's, there's one example. Here's another one where I actually changed the shape of the bead. I made a, a, a square cross section out of this. Those are pretty small, I, I realize that. But watch them change as I rotate them. Kind of a bright pink, and there's the blue thing. Anyway, I also uh, pushed the hole through those at a diagonal just uh, for interest's sake. But anyway, so there's some examples of some uh, ways to use that. Now, there's one other little variation that you can do with this, a real simple one. Take that square bead that, we, that I just showed you how to make, the two-color bead, and knock the corners off. That is, th with your tissue blade, cut straight down, <coughs> removing each one of those corners, essentially making it into an octagon, looking like this one, giving an, octag an octagonal shape. Now look at that one as it rotates around. Look how it changes. And I've got an even better one over here. I'll show you in a second. Better in the sense that I like these colors better. Watch this one. The colors are almost unbelievable, the way they change as you go around. And all that is is that two-color bead I just showed you with the corners cut off and then baked, sanded, and polished. I love these. I love all this stuff. Uh, now I'm going to show you how to make uh, uh, some blended sheets and blended ingots. Here's a blended sheet so you can see what we're going for here. In order to make that, here's the procedure for that. We start out with a couple of uh, rolled out metallic sheets. They don't have to be completely rolled out, in fact. Uh, I mean, and they don't have to go a long ways with this, but uh, nice, flat, identically sized shaped sheets. Take your two colors, use a straight edge, make a diagonal cut across each one, like that, so that we wind up with four separate pieces. Assemble this, or reassemble, take it apart and reassemble it like this, put the one of your colors like that, that's good and clear. And now <coughs> take the other two pieces and kind of make an X in the middle, an X like this, does that show? Yeah, there you go. Take that other gold piece and put it right there, and the other green one, and fill in this missing gap right here. Okay, that's exactly how it has to go. Now, I like to push them together a little bit so everything, nothing falls apart when we move it over to the pasta machine. And then pick it up off the paper. Here's what it looks like. The only thing to think about to see if you got this right is to make sure you've got two, uh, color, two of the same colors on one edge and two of the same colors on the other edge. As long as you got that, you're ready to go. Take this over to the pasta machine and now, I like, well, the object here is to keep this sheet roughly two inches or so, or fairly narrow. That's something uh, you may not have done before with this, uh, this blend. By the way, this is called the Skinner blend, the Skinner pasta blend. Skinner pasta blend was invented by a lady named Judith Skinner. We love her for this. Um, sometimes I use a tool braced up against this side. I put one side against the edge of the pasta machine where my thumb is over here and use some kind of a tool on the other side. Start it in there and run it through one time. And now, fold it in half, the long way, run it through again. J if you just put a little bit of back pressure on this, hold your hand like this and just hold it up a little bit, that'll keep it narrow also. But we don't want this thing to get too wide on us. So pass it through. The exact number of times is really pretty arbitrary. Uh, it will be completely blended by the time you go 15 or 20 times, you may not want to go that far. It kind of depends what you want. Anyway, keep on going with this. I'm in the way there. 
This is why we had the paper on the back of our pasta machine so it doesn't stick when I pull it through like that. Anyway, continue this process, folding, passing through the pasta machine until you get this real nice, smooth blend right there. You can do this with any two metallic colors. You can do this with any two colors, period, but we're working with metallic, so isn't that beautiful? Now, you can turn this into a, a, a blended ingot very simply, same way we did it before. Cut, let's see if I can make that a little bit easier for you to see. Just cut some pieces up and stack them up. And we'll be doing some projects in a few minutes that use these, and I think you'll like the effect. <clears throat> and continue that process until you get it as, as high as you need it, because you got your, your ingot. Here's a nice little easy bead we can make with one of these blended sheets. We're going to shoot for something like that, a little snail like that. Um, I like to use, have it a little bit thicker than a single sheet like this, so I'm just going to take two of them and stack them up here. Just give myself a little more thickness to work with. Pat them down. Move them around so you can see what I'm going to do here next. I didn't quite get them lined up here. That's not that critical anyway. Okay. What I need to do is cut a, a first I want to cut a straight edge off of that, get, a, get this edge cleaned up. Let's make it so you can see it. Knock that off of there. And then cut a wedge. It doesn't really matter uh, whether the outside of that snail is green or gold. Make a decision. Let's make this one green. So we want to make that the wider piece of it. So I'll cut it at a slant like this so that the goal, is, the goal end is a little bit narrower. Cut down through that. Pull it out of there. There's the piece we're working with. And just start rolling it up from the skinny end towards the wide end. Kind of a quick and dirty one here. The, uh, you're f you'll find that this clay kind of bends and uh, distorts on you a little bit as you do that. It actually, it, it adds a lot of interest to them. See that? It gives a, a nice texture to the whole thing. So there's that one. Here's a Here's how it would look if we had put the gold on the outside. That's just the opposite blend there. You can kind of compare those two. Anyway, your call on that, whatever you like there. Now, we can also work with an ingot and make something a little bit different here. So here's a, an ingot that I created by stacking up slices of this sheet into a little dull side, shiny side affair, just like the, uh, our, our other ingots were. And I'm going to wind up making something that's very similar to those snail shells, but with a little bit more interest. First of all, I want to clean up my edge again. That is, cut a nice, cut one slice off and toss it off so I've got a square edge to work with. Um, let's do this one just like the last one, that is, with the green on the outside. So I'm going to cut a wedge off. Oh, actually, wait a minute. I, I'm, that's not quite right. What I have to do is cut a, a chunk off that's, oh, that wide, let's say. Make it a square cross section. This isn't very critical. Quarter inch wide or something like that. Now notice there's the dull side, there's the shiny side. I don't know how well it shows here like that. Okay, what we're going to do here is texture this surface. I'm going to pat down with the flat side, the dull side that is, the dull side up, stick it down to the table to your work surface. And I'm going to bring in my burnishing tool. Here's what this burnishing tool is for. Now what I'm going to do is make strokes across this thing, all the way across the whole length of this. And watch what happens when I do. It's almost like drawing on it's almost like painting on this clay. What I'm doing besides adding texture, well that shows up real, real well there, besides adding texture, it also tilts all those mica flakes that we talked about earlier and makes this a shiny side, although it's a, sort of an irregular shiny side. The effect is really cool, and we're going to use it in some of the projects that we're going to do in a little while anyway. So it's cool all by itself. Run all the way across with this. I'll do this one kind of quick so we can get on to it here. You can be real uh, free-handed about this. Look at how that color's coming out. You can just see that now I'm getting into the gold end. Like that. You can use a, a wider tool if you like. You can just play around with this. There's just a lot of possibilities with this. Okay, once you've got that whole thing textured, I like to roll the edges over just a little bit, just to, to take some of the roughness off. But, and I think I'm going to move this so you can see this cut again. <clears throat> what I do is, what I want to do is cut a wedge out of this so that I can make my snail. I'm going to cut it so that I've got, uh, let's see, this the other way. With the wider end being gold like that. Now that shows pretty well. That's what I want. Cut down through there like so. 
looks a lot like that last one, and then start rolling it up. I don't know how um, visible the texture will be on your screen today, but in up close and in person, either there, yeah, you can see the how my neat that is. Looks like a real shell. And here's a here's another one in another color that I did, a kind of purple and blue thing that's been burnished up, polished up a little bit. These are pretty cool. So we'll use these a little bit later on, and they can be used by themselves. Put a hole through it, make your rings out of them. They're beautiful. Here's a piece that I'm going to make using both sheets, blended sheets, and blended ingots. It's gonna, it goes like this. We start out with our uh, blended sheet, cut it into pieces and stack it into an ingot. Remember, shiny side up and a dull face over there. Cut a slice off of it. Oh, call it a, oh, I don't know, eighth to a quarter inch, quarter inch or so. A reasonable chunk cut off of it. And then with a hole cutting tool, like this, some sort of a hole cutting tool, Punch a hole into that. Here's the piece that I removed to get that out of the way. Cut a hole right through it. Somewhere along the way here, stop and uh, maybe before we cut the hole, and press over this with your finger real well. Work it together. Make sure all those uh, sheets are well stuck together that the thing isn't falling apart on you. And then from the sheet, cut a strip, just like we did the snails a few minutes ago. Cut a wedge, actually, a wedge-shaped strip. There it is. And roll it up into a snail like that. Uh, just to make sure that we're going to put that snail into the hole that we cut out back here. So take your uh, hole cutting tool and press it down over the top of the s your snail after you've got it rolled to make sure that's going to fit in that hole. Then do that, stuff it into the hole. And I mean stuff it, I mean you'll have to fudge it in there and fuss around with it a little bit to get it to fit, to fit. And then with your fingers, press it in there real well. The only thing left to do is to bake it and then sand it. Now I've got one that's finished over here. I want to show you how what a, a neat effect it can be. This one right here. <clears throat> this out of the way. Here I've you can see how I polished up the the surface, sanded it, wet or dry sandpaper, and then uh, buffed it a little bit. Look how there's still that that, that three dimensional quality in the snail in there as I roll it around. That's the part, one of the really cool things about this. The other side I didn't sand. It's still pretty cool too, but you can see the roughness and. There's the snail sitting in the hole there. Anyway, this is uh, one of our favorite pieces around here. Here's another bead that we can make using ingots and blended sheets. Looks like this, got kind of a lovely edge, kind of a copper and turquoise color. Here's what we're gonna do, you need to make that. Here's the little recipe I've, I've shown you how to make a copper, make a beautiful copper out of, oh, let's say uh, four parts of gold to one part of red, pearl red. That's what that is right there. This is just very approximate. Play around with this and get a color that you like. That Mix that up. Uh, then the uh, turquoise part, I've got, well, what are we, can we see this here? Yeah, I've got, I always use some silver and pearl together, and then equal parts of blue and green. Again, play around with these colors. These are approximate uh, quantities. You can see what I've got there. Uh, roll those two pieces in, in using the Skinner blend into a sheet. It comes out looking like that. Isn't that beautiful? You can't see the turquoise to there. You can see that turquoise. Um, cut it up and stack it up into an ingot. That nice ingot right there. Then we're going to take a slice of it, a fairly thick slice, something about like that, off of the dull face of the ingot. I'm going to cut it in half right down the middle. Take this out of here for a second and show you. That's, that is just this piece here cut in half there. And then I've cut a strip. Uh, actually, I took a couple of, of sheets, layered them up, and turned them on their other edge, the shiny side up, then reassembled them and cut them into a different shape, and then finally uh, baked and sanded the piece like this. Let me demonstrate one of those for you. There's an ingot all ready to go. All I'm going to do is cut a nice straight, hopefully, sheet. Uh, make these a little thicker than then your inclination is, I mean, make a fairly thick one because it needs some material to sand off. We want these things to be kind of chunky, I think. I personally like them that way. I'm going to call it a quarter of an inch, maybe a little more than that. Right down through it, like so. Tip it off. There you see it. Now we'll get rid of this piece and just use this. Then take that and 
cut it right down the middle, right in half. Push it apart like this. Now, I need to make that strip to go in the middle. You need to have that strip that goes down the center here has to be the same thickness as these two halves. So take as many sheets as you need to get that. I've got two here. I'll try to keep it in so you can see it here. It should be pretty close. If I needed another one, add another sheet on top of that. Anyway, this is shiny side up, notice. These look like they are, but they're actually dull. There's the shiny side, this is the dull side. Keep that all kind of straight. And make a, a, a strip off, cut a strip off of this that's, oh, I'm, I'm gonna think it's about as wide as this thing is tall. That's what I've got in mind anyway. Shoot for something about like that. Cut that off of there. Get rid of that. Now, take that strip, and uh, just to make it interesting, reverse its direction. Now, you can really see the difference here. Now, see how this is the shiny side there? That's going to go right down the center. Now, I've got a little bit of a height difference here, but that's okay. We'll make this one work today. Put them together like that. See how cool that is with that piece running down the middle right there? Now, this, this is a real important step here. Bring this together and fudge it together with your fingers. Really bring it together pack it down from either side. Do a lot of that so that you get all the little spaces and cracks together. I'm going to flip it over. It'll look a little bit cooler on that side there. You can see how, how nicely it's going. Anyway, make sure that you spend some time with that. Get that all the uh, air spaces out of it. And then uh, we want to cut it into a shape. I happen to kind of like that oval shape. I'm always bending blades. I'm always curving my blades, so you can do a lot of this kind of thing. Pick a shape that you like. I'm going to go for an oval. I guess you could do just about anything you wanted to, but put that blade into a curve. That, here, that well, I'll make a little mark and then show you what we're going for there, like that. See what that shows up there. You see that there? You can kind of see that arc across the top. Anyway, you'll see it in a second. Right there, right straight down through it. Cutting one half round like that. Turn it around this way. Cut the other side so it looks like that one and you got you a nice bead, like that. I like to knock the, I'm gonna turn this this way. I like to knock this little end off right here, and this one. Gives me a, a flat, flat ends of work with it. It looks pretty cool right there, uh, but there's actually a fair amount of roughness and, and uh, blade drag visible here, and all that's gonna go away when we bake and sand this thing. So there it is. Let me show you a, a finished piece that I made that's kind of like this in similar colors, but uh, slightly smaller beads. There's one all strung together. Maybe we can get a little bit wider shot in there. You can see that. Makes a pretty dramatic piece when you see it in person. Those edges there kind of uh, echoing, repeating that stripe right there. Anyway, give that one a try. It's a lot of fun. Let's take this simple bead we just made and See if I can't beat it to death for you here. I like to do this, take these ideas and then work on that theme and uh, come up with other ideas. Here's a bead that's an awful lot like it. It's actually a pair, one of a pair of earrings. The only thing that's different about it when you flip it over is that I've burnished the surface like we did our snail before by dragging the burnishing tool over it. Well, continuing with that, getting even more crazy with all this stuff, we can uh, come up with something that looks like this. Um, that you can see how similar this is to that, uh, whoops, to the earring that I just showed you. In fact, look at the back of this. Looks like that piece we did a little while ago. The, the surprise on this is that this is actually a locket. When you swing the door open, I put another little snail in there and actually put a freshwater pearl in it. So let me show you how we're going to do that. Just I got a lot of fun here. <clears throat> here are the pieces that we need to make it. How's that? You need to cut your sheets out, roll your sheets out. It's a Skinner blend. Just get that let's lay on it there. Um, shiny side up, you know, as always. Form them into an ingot, a blended ingot like that. Cut a slab off, like we did that last project there, uh, off this dull side. Cut it fairly thick, again, so that you've got some material to work with. Cut it in half like we did before, right down the middle and then burnish it at that point. Take your uh, tool and drag it across the surface. Let me show you the, the, the top and there you go. So maybe you can see the, let's see if we can see the difference here on those two. See the difference? So burnish those two halves, make a strip to go down the center just like we did with that uh, 
that last bead there that one set it right on the middle there push it together I actually cut that out of a double layer here before I, I did that put it, push it together like this do a lot of that finger work again you won't really, you might be worried about uh, losing that burnished effect but it's it's fairly durable it actually can stand a fair amount of manipulation and then flip it over and do the same thing to the back pushing everything together then we'll take our hole cutting tool and pick a spot where you want the the locket door to be uh, push that cut that out of there here's the chunk I took out just so you can see how that went um, make a take a sheet of clay and make one of these spiral shells this one has got a texture on it I don't know if you can see it or not but uh, texture it with some sort of a texturing tool I use that little uh, a scouring pad that I showed you at the beginning of today's lesson. At any rate, uh, it's just fine if it's shiny, but you can get away with uh, some of the bubbles that sometimes form if you'll texture it a little bit. Now, there's another one right here that's pretty much the same as this one. It's the, the colors are reversed. That is, the purple part is on the outside. Otherwise, it's the same except for one thing. That's the size. It's got. This is the piece that's going to go down into this, into the hole here. So after you roll this snail out cut it with the hole cutter so that it fits drop it down the center there you may not want to go but you have a little bit of fussing around you can get it in there um, then and this is all optional stuff you could it's not half bad the way it is right there but I decided I wanted a little dome effect on mine so I took a solid piece of clay in this turquoise color a couple of sheets of it stuck together Stuck it right there. Cut it out with a tissue blade uh, in, a, in a curved form. In fact, let's look at the finished piece and you can really see that. See that little dome right there? I just rolled, took that and cut it with my blade. Then finally we added this little trim around the outside, which is nothing but a strip of um, plain metallic purplish clay. Right here is some of it that I used. I'll show you how that works in just a second. Um, once you get to this point, once it's, once it's right here, it's ready to bake. And then we'll add the little trim, put the door on, show you a few other little things. Okay, we've seen all the steps that get at this, get us this far. We've seen something like this before. So take that piece that's all ready to go. The only thing new here is adding a hole. So take my hole cutter and pick it. I kind of like it towards the bottom of the piece, but it's up to you where you want to put that. Push that right down through there. And sometimes they come right out, sometimes they don't. No, this one won't, of course. Okay, so pull it out of there. There we go, and here's the piece I just pulled out. We're not going to need that, so we can, we can get rid of this. Now, you got a nice round hole right there. Now, remember the snail piece that I made a little while ago? That's going to be the filler piece that's going to go in there. It was made with a sheet of clay rolled up, um, and to make sure that it fits, I push my hole cut over the top of it, trim off any excess, drop it down there. Actually, you can put it in there a couple of ways. You can either drop it down through the top and fudge it in that way, or lay it onto the table and bring the, the uh, locket right down over it and tap it down in there like that. Let's, let's see if it's sticking okay. I'm going to lift the whole thing up. Look at the back. Not too bad. Do a little bit of finger work on there. We're going to bake this all together in a little while and uh, we want to make sure that it holds together. So uh, fuss around with that a little bit. That's what we've got so far. Uh, to make it uh, a little cooler, here's that little dome piece I decided to add to the top here. Right now it's just a little stack of some turquoise sheets. Bring that into there like this. Tuck it in there and try to get the stick a little bit right now. We'll, we'll uh, work that a little bit harder, but get it into position. And then I want to cut it into a dome. And again, here comes another opportunity to bend your blade here. Uh, so pick an arch or an arc that looks good to you. Probably pretty tough for you to see, but um, I have to cut from this position, push it down through there, and then take that away, and there it is, is our little dome-shaped top. Just for sort of safety's sake, you can sort of hold together, just tuck it down a little bit. We're getting there, looking pretty good. But the only thing we need here to finish it up, and it's, it's kind of an optional thing, is a piece of trim around the outside. Now this can be, uh, it, it's a bit of an issue. Take your, pick your color that you want there, roll out a thin sheet, and remember the dull side, shiny side thing. Well, we don't want our piece of trim with its dull side up. So to make sure that we get a shiny side up, 
when you roll the sheet out like this, fold it in half one last time, run through the pasta machine lengthwise like this, and that'll make sure that you've got a nice, shiny, metallic edge like this. Here's a piece that I've prepared ahead of time. You see what that is, and if this is what the other side would be. See how dull it is, and, it's, and that's not very visible, but you would see it when you put it together, trust me. This side, nice, shiny looking thing. Now this is a little bit of a fuss job, so let me see if I can lay your strip out like so. What I usually do is try to get that as straight as I can. You can just do this with your fingers and, and wrap it around there, but I, I have better luck doing it this way. Then take the locket, and there's the shiny side out there, so I want it to be in the front. Oops, I'm going to turn this so you can see it better. That's not going to look too well there. Here's what I want. <coughs> like that. Lay this right along here like so. Tap it down. Once it starts to stick, then you can kind of lift the whole thing up and with a little luck. This is, I, I told you, it a, requires some fussing around. And just take it and run it around the, the border like this. Since this is uncooked clay, it will stick to itself pretty well. Getting a good shot there, yeah. And maybe then trim that last little tail uh, there off. Now go around and just squeeze everything together, make sure it's not uh, got any nasty gaps or you know loose ends someplace. Not bad, huh? So far. Okay, one little thing I like to do before I bake, this isn't absolutely critical, but I remember the, the, the lid that we made earlier, that large size snail, which I didn't trim down. In fact, it, it needs to be bigger than the hole because it has to cover it. This is our little lid. I want to make sure it all is going to work, so I lay that lid over the hole, see that it works. I've drilled a little hole in this. I'm not sure you can see it, but I took my drill bit and drilled a hole right there. So I want to put that right over the center and make sure my hole is covered, taking a pin or some sharp pointed thing that'll go through this hole. Just reach in there and make a mark on the locket to show you where that hinge is going to be. Does that show it all there? Just barely. Yeah. So that's where our, our hinge is going to be after we bake this piece. And that's the next thing to do. Bake it, and then we'll add all the, the trim and findings here in a second. OK, now that we've baked uh, our piece, it's all assembled and ready to go, um, at this point, just to, as a sort of a finishing touch, sand the back nice and smooth. I think that's a, you know, a improve your craftsmanship a little bit. Looks nice to flip that thing over and see the back of it. Now all we have to do is add the, the finishing touches, the lid, a couple of uh, uh, eye pins up in the top to attach a chain, and, and whatever other embellishments that uh, you want to add. But I'm going to put some beads in the bottom of mine. Let's take care of that lid first. All you need is a little chunk of wire. Remember, I marked that. Well, first of all, I marked that hole a little earlier right there, so the place where the hinge is going to go. Take your drill bit. Use that as a pilot hole and drill it down. I, don't go all the way to the back. Just make it, uh, I put my finger in the back, and the minute I can feel that drill, I stop there. <laughs> then take a piece of wire. Here, let's lay that down for a second. A little short chunk of wire. In fact, we're going to trim this so it can be just about any length. Put a little super glue on it, a little bit of a uh, zap a gap, like so. Make sure I get some on here. And drop it down that hole. That needs to be firmly anchored in there. See, it doesn't move. It's not going to rotate. That piece is going to be firmly fixed in there. So make sure that that's set up there, um, solid. Take your lid, which has already got a hole drilled into it. Probably not very visible, but there's one there. Get it onto that hinge, like that. Looks like it's positioned pretty well to me. Swings freely. I don't want it to swing too freely, so uh, we'll you need to think about this a little bit. Um, the only thing that's left is to add a handle of some kind. Not a handle, but something to hide that wire and make it a little bit more interesting. And I've got a little bead I'm going to drop on there and then show it to you like this. I well, see the problem is that that wire is sticking out of the top there. So take a look at how much you need. Take your bead off and snip that wire down to just enough to, for the bead to hang on to and not enough for it to stick out for all the world to see. That's pretty flush there. There you can see it pretty much against my finger. Now, here's a, this is a little bit tricky. We're going to have to glue the bead onto this without gluing the, 
the uh, lid onto the locket. So uh, be discreet with your glue is all I can say. So I'm gonna add a little bit of, get some glue to stick on that wire if I can, so I can see it on there. Come on. Sometimes I have to do this a couple of times to get it to work. So you wanna use too much glue and push it down and hold it down there for a second. Now I press it fairly hard. What I'm wanting to do is put some tension against the lid so that when the glue sets up, um, th that, that lid isn't, isn't just swinging around freely there. It's got some little bit of friction on it. But a little luck, I got it to work. Doesn't look too bad. Okay, so that's the idea anyway. Might have to do that again if it didn't, if it didn't work out for you. But uh, that's the, the, the procedure at any rate. Okay, then we need something to hang it from, obviously. Now, you could do a single hole in the top and, and add an eye pin there, but they tend to twist on you when you wear them. So I, I like to have uh, two fastening points. What I've done is picked a couple of spots in the top, drilled holes down into it, kind of watching to make sure you keep them straight like this. I drilled another one just like it over here. <clears throat> Take a couple of eye pins that I've got all set here. They're one of them, pretty small. And they're going to go in that hole like that. See that? I'm going to glue that in there. Drop it down in the hole. It'll work kind of quick with this stuff. It sets up on you. Do the other one. Like so. Okay, so there's two, there you go. You see those two pins sticking out there. And uh, you can use whatever cord or chain that you want. You can put a couple of jump rings on there and you know, any number of options are available to you. Now, it, it, it could be finished right there, but I kind of like to uh, add a little something down in here. Here's uh, one option that I've, I created this little, so all it is is a little uh, zigzaggy piece of wire that I slip some beads on there. See, they're kind of, I don't want them to fall off of here, but they're all loose on that rolling around. What I've done is made that just wide enough to match the bottom of this, like that. I marked the places where those would hit. I'm not sure the holes will show. I've already drilled the holes. There they are right there. And then glue those into those holes like so here. I didn't put any glue on here, but uh, that's what you'd want to do last. Put some glue in those tips, push it in, and look at that. And I like the way they, they kind of rattle there. So there's our completed locket. I think I'll give this to my producer. Kind of dandy. We ran through all the steps of making that locket. Uh, there are lots and lots of variations. Uh, we're going to show you a few other ones, but uh, surface variations, for, for starters, is a good place to uh, depart here. And just taking up uh, another slice of uh, an ingot like this, there's all kinds of ways to put interesting textures on this stuff. Um, let me show you one right here. Just, just take a, a burnishing tool and just kind of uh, give a free hand here, make some kind of random strokes in this. I'll show you. I'll tilt this in a second. You can see what I'm getting out of this. See those marks in there? What I've done is raise that metallic quality of the clay all the way through. What I like to do is turn it around the other way and, and make some diagonal marks across this way. There's just a ton of things you can do with this. Uh, I've got, made a couple of specialized tools. Here's one where I wrap some wire around it and sometimes I take and drag this across the tool. And You have to drag your tool. You can't get the metallic quality by just pressing into this. You'll get texture that way, but you won't get any of the metallic properties. So there's one. I might drag some lines across there. Sometimes I use uh, another one that's a little bit finer than that. Here's just a, a finer gauge of copper wire on that one. It barely even shows, but that's what that is, is a fine wrap of copper wire, and I would drag it across the surface of it. All kinds of options. Play with it a little bit. Just make sure that you drag when you do that. Now, the, the other part of it is, once you've got that let me show you how it looks right now. It's not actually too bad, but it gets even better when you put it through the pasta machine. So I'm going to take it over there and pass it through the pasta machine a time or two. And I say a time or two, run it through as many times as until you like the looks of it. It's going to change a little bit. Now run it through uh, sideways, that is uh, horizontally, if you will, the way I've got it in there right now. You could go the other way, but uh, it tends to change your pattern in ways that, let's see if, we can, if that shows very well. See the texture on there? And I, I did one earlier here that I think I like a little bit better. Again, I, sometimes I, I make one of these and I don't like it. I just 
toss it aside and it doesn't use very much clay it's a pretty thin sheet anyway this we're going to use this like a veneer once we get a, a pattern on here that we like look at how it shimmers and shines and changes as you go once we get that veneer made well go back to assembling a locket here I would just lay this over the top of it and begin assembling cutting my locket uh, at that point with the, this is the new surface over here I'll just make you give you a quick demo of what I'm talking about cut this down so that it fits the the piece underneath and then go through all those steps that we just did a few minutes ago and we'd have a, a lock with a face like this here's one that's uh that's that's got a texture that's it's not the same as that but it's certainly uh you can see there's a, a lot of shimmery light sort of stuff i know it's an entirely different shape also but that's that's another choice you have of cutting it this way we're going to talk about this this type of hinge and this type of door in a little while and then there's another one also it's certainly possible just to take um, a, a straight sh shiny sheet of clay and add a texture to it and use that as the surface let's walk through that one for a second here. Sure, we, should, we got that one ready to go here for you it, a lot of things are going to be the same as what we've done before first of all i need to mention something here both that last piece uh, in the in the last segment about the the uh the, the locket actually had a kind of a purple or violet colored clay in it we didn't discuss the recipe for that it's a blend of half silver half pearl and then this is violet a non-metallic color I had said earlier that uh, you usually want to stick with metallic colors well this one using small amounts works pretty nice leaves you a nice a lot of metallic quality in it so go ahead and, and and try that out anyway that's the the recipe that gave me this this piece there's a piece of it back there um, and then we're going to use this is just the uh, my formula for a nice whitey silver it's silver and pearl so you cut your uh, roll your sheets out cut them out stack them up into an ingot like this it's two or three layers thick again this is the beginnings of a locket you know, what we're doing is walking through the steps for a, um, a locket like that heart shaped one not the harp shaped one but the uh, the valentine one I made for my wife there we're gonna and this this time I it's a all one piece kind of a monolith I've just taken the piece and, and cut it cut a half circle up there and this one isn't going to show very much I think but I'm going to tell you that I textured this and there's a re good reason for doing that besides the it adding interest uh, flat sheets of clay have a tendency to bubble when you when you bake them little bubbles will show up and will drive you crazy you'll have this beautiful piece and you put it in the oven and doggone thing will come out with a, a bubble showing and this tends to hide all that sort of stuff and it's a it's a creative way to hide it you know an uh, artistic way to hide it so put some texture on there now I've already punched a hole in this one as you can see and I've made my my uh, this is going to be the lid for this one so we're going to go to that in a few minutes uh, and show you how to how to how to put that hinge on that special hinge that drops down in there this is the locket I showed you a few minutes ago I pointed out had a different kind of a hinge different kind of a door than that last locket that we did the one that swung out of the way this one actually has a hinge in it that opens and closes like a door there you can see the hinge sticking out right there let me show you how we put that in there how it all works what the heck it is in the first place so bringing in here's what we're going to work with uh, a piece that's a lot like the uh, last segment that we did what I use for those hinges and I kind of developed this in the last month or so figured out that I can use this an ordinary old pin back you've seen these we've used them before for backing up uh, brooches and so forth I don't need this whole pin I just need the hinge part so I'm going to cut away the clasp part over here so make sure you uh, be a little careful when you do that that doesn't go flying off what I usually do is bend that part straight first like that and then just cut the tab off there like that get rid of it and I don't need all of the pin point either so cut back oh I don't know you're gonna have to you'll see in a second how much of that you need but something in the neighborhood of three eighths of an inch or so left to work with so that it, it's modified a little bit you've got the flat tang piece and part of the pin I know we've lost the point but that's not going to be a big problem I'm going to put this hinge in the center of my locket up right up in here is where it's going to rest and it needs to go just below the surface that is I mean, I'm not going to just stick it into the top of it here it's got to go to the inside of the lid in fact you can see I've made a little hole in there you see that I marked it with a pin ahead of time and then this is a little tricky this is a lot of manipulation here but get that pin in there and kind of angle it down I don't think you can see that. No, you can't. But the pin actually angles um, 
like this. It angles through the clay in that direction. Push it in until it's until the hinge is just flush with the clay. Now it's going to go in further than that, but I can't. It's going to mash the clay if I do that. So once I get it to that point, get an X-Acto knife. I ain't going to help if I lay this like this. What I'm going to do is cut out this material right here. That little where the where the hinge body is going to fit right there. So I'm going to mark it out. Pull the hinge out of the way, and then attempt to do that here in this in these hot lights. What I'm doing is just taking out about an eighth of an inch little cube of clay. Try to keep it nice and neat because uh, it's going to wrap around your hinge at the end. Your hinge is going to show there, and you, know, you want a nice, neat looking hole. Anyway, pull a chunk of clay out of there, roughly the size of that hinge portion. There, you see the nice little notch that I cut out of there? Okay, now we're going to come back with that. Again, make sure that this thing fits. Put it back into the hole, if you can get it there. Shove it in. Now this time, I'm going to push it all the way. I know this is pretty small, but uh, I'm going to show you the finished product. Push it till the hinge is totally flush up with the edge. None of it can hang into the into here. So we got to you know we've got to have a clean hole right through there. So make sure that that hinge goes all the way up there. And now bake the piece. Uh, the reason we have to bake it now is because uh, in order to attach the lid and everything, it really helps to have this all firmed up and ready to go. So before we move to the next step, go ahead and bake this just like that. Well, after the piece is baked, looks like this, we're actually going to pull that hinge back out. It'll just slip right out like that. And you just can't rely on the um, the baking process to keep to, to co hold your hinge in place. So what I'm going to do is glue it in there. So put and this is another one I need to talk to you about a bit while I'm doing it. Uh, be a little discreet with this glue. You need to have enough on there to hold it in. But if you get too much, it's going to run all over the joint and freeze your hinge right up. You don't definitely don't want that. So try to hit that hole again if I can. There we go. And slip it right in there. And with a little luck, it'll lock right in place. There we go. And then let it set up. And then it sw should swing like that. So there it is. Now it's locked in place. It's glued in there. Now we got to talk about a lid. Uh, I think I showed that to you a little bit earlier. At any rate, it's one of these uh, snails that we made. And this one's cooked already. So uh, I made this one kind of thin, roll it up. And I checked to see that it fit into the hole before. And it looks like it does pretty well. It fits right in there. So. What I'm going to do is put a little glue. Actually, I'm going to take the, sorry, I lost you there a second. Take the, uh, the lid and put it down uh, upside down on the table. And then I'm going to add a little glue to the hinge like this. Just put a little bit on there. Come on. There it goes. And then lay it down over the top like this. The little lid should fall in place. I don't have a great fit right here, but there we go. Gluing that down like that. If it went at all, and it didn't glue too well. At any rate, that's the idea. Make, get that glued onto there. I think I'm going to try it one more time right here. Get a little glue on here. So I've got to have the, the lid stuck to the piece or we can't go ahead. Come on. So put that on there like so. There we go. I think this time maybe I had a little more luck. May not close quite right, but, but that's, that's the object, is to get it glued on there. Now, that would be OK to leave it like that, but it looks kind of unfinished. I got my own a little bit off center, but uh, tried to do yours a little bit better than that. I was a little bit rushed there. Um, uh, to finish this off real nice, I'm going to take uh, some other contrasting color of clay. Here's a little piece of a uh, uh, sort of purple thing. And I've got a hole cutter that's a little bit smaller than this. You see it goes right in there. And just cut a little piece off like that. Hopefully it'll lift up off the table all right. And I'm going to use that to just to cover up the hinge to give us a more finished look here, like this. Place it over the back like that. Kind of squeeze it down like so. And then uh, in a little while, we're, we're going to bake this piece again anyway, and it's going to cook that clay at that time. 
Um, that's about ready to go there. I think that's the end of the story on the lid. This one doesn't want to close too well. It's not bad, but with a little bit of care, you can get that thing to close just really nice and snug. Now, what we don't have is a back on this thing, uh, so we need to talk about that briefly. You saw in one of those other pieces that I made a, a snail and set it in there. You can make anything that you want to put in there, or you know, can treat it as a locket, use it as an empty space to put a, um, a photo or something, simply by putting a back on the whole thing. Now, here's a piece of clay that kind of matches the, the pattern here that I've actually got a little texture on it that I'm going to put down this way, lay it down. Um, doesn't matter which way the blend goes, I don't guess. Lay the piece, the locket, right on that back. Press it down so that it adheres there. And then just go around and trim up, trim the backing to match the, the shape of the locket. I'll, I'll pick it up and show it to you when I finish here so you can see what we got. The curved part can be a little bit dicey, but just all this can be sanded when we finish, so it isn't real critical that this come out perfect at this point. Now, if I can get it off of there without, yeah, well, it fell loose, but that's okay. I've got it this cut to the right size. Put it down there, pat it together. Uh, some of that mineral oil, um, or some mineral oil will work if you put mineral oil under here, or some, some Sculpey diluent, some of that, uh, polymer clay diluent between these, that helps. But if you fuss with a little bit, it'll stay on there anyway. So there's our back on there, and it becomes the inside of the locket as well. Fills the, the hole there. Now you're ready to put anything that you want in there at all. And of course, to add the, the additional trim pieces, you know, wrapping some sort of a strip around the outside if you like, and then uh, the findings, and it's all ready to go. That last little locket was kind of a quick demo. Uh, we had problems with the glue and stuff. 